Hey everyone, welcome back to another 10 minute Q&A. Stay tuned until the end because we've got postcards. All right, let's get that 10 minutes on the clock and get this thing going. So everyone seemed very receptive to this idea and you guys left so many great questions. So I'm going to whip through as many as I can without trying to talk too fast. Uh, I love it all. Are you going to continue your wine and weed series? I can't wait. Yes, I am. And I think there'll be one of those sooner rather than later. My garden suffers from deer pressure. Um, last summer, the deer devoured them and they look terrible. Have you used deer deterrent? Also, if this is at our cottage and I'm only there on weekends to apply granular or powder. I'm going to link to a video I did about how I manage deer. Listen, the, the only real deer repellent, deer deterrent, is an eight foot fence. Let's assume that most of us can't or don't want to do that. So what I use is apply deer repellent like religiously. So if I get out there once every 10 days or less, and I know that sounds like a lot, but this is what we do, um, with my chosen deer repellent. Now I like Messina's deer stopper too. A lot of people love liquid fence and plant skid are also both very good. I like the deer stopper cause it smells better and it seems to work equally as well for me. But the key is you have to stay on top of reapplying. And it's not so much that it washes off, it's that the plants keep growing so there's unprotected foliage in there. So those are the things that work for me. And I think if you're only getting someplace on weekends that's more than enough, just spray everything. Now, if you're not there, the deer do tend to come around more. So you, you, know, you might have to really start thinking about only planting really deer resistant things. Curious about the sunglass brand you use to correct to protect your eyes. It's important to care about our eyes. Yes, it is. I can't keep this on because I can't see the monitor with it because they're polarized. I always go for polarized glasses because I spend a lot of time on the water. My chosen brand is Maui Jim. I'm pretty faithful to them. They have great customer service and um, they should sponsor me now. I'm kidding. No, they're great glasses. I love them and I've been wearing them for probably over a decade at least. If you could garden in a different zone or region, what would it be? This is a pretty easy one for me. I think zone seven is sort of like the end all be all of gardening zones. Warm enough that you can grow a lot of really fun things and garden like almost year round and cool enough that you can still grow a lot of cool things that you wouldn't be able to grow if it were warmer. I was watching a video by a gardener who tries to be as ecological as possible in her gardening. She suggested pulling weeds to leave them on the ground to rot in place as compost. Um, and then this person goes on to say that they don't compost their weeds and they're afraid to use this method because they're afraid they're going to um, reroute and they dispose of them in the trash. So how likely is it that tough, stubborn weeds would reroute in place? Okay, so amazing question and I struggle with this myself. So first of all, it helps to know what weed you're dealing with and what kind of weed it is. If it's an annual, you can pull that out and let it lay right there. It's not going to reroot. It's not going to come back. Assuming you have pulled it before it sets seeds. If it sets seeds, that's how annual weeds like chickweeds go absolutely insane is that the flowers are so small. So Obviously you want to get on those early and you can absolutely let those lay or put those in the compost, assuming you've caught them before um, they've gone to seed, which would could perpetuate your problem. If they are a perennial weed, I don't blame you for being worried about them rerooting. And I think that's a valid concern. Um, you could lay those out in the sun on, you know, on the driveway or whatever and let them dry out um, and then throw them in the compost. If we're talking about a truly invasive weed, uh, garlic mustard weed, um, creeping bellflower are two that I deal with that are very bad. Um, those go in the trash. They never go anywhere else because they absolutely can spread. And um, cities are required to take noxious weeds in their um, like trash facilities. So you are able to legally dispose of those um, in a bag. On to the next question. I have a hydrangea that died suddenly from what sounds like verticillium wilt. Is there anything I can do to fix the soil? Can I never plant there again? Do I need to be worried about spreading to nearby plants? I have great news for you. 
I'm guessing it's not verticillium wilt. And you know why I know that? Because hydrangeas are just not that susceptible to it. Now, of course, they can get it, but they are not one of the plants that are very susceptible to verticillium wilt. So my guess is it's actually not that. Um, if it were that, though, uh, first of all, there are plants, there are lists of plants that are not susceptible to verticillium wilt. So you can think about replanting in that area with something that is not um, uh, that is not uh, susceptible to that. The cure for verticillium wilt um, to really deal with it is essentially solarizing your soil for like years. It's really a bummer. I have had confirmed verticillium wilt uh, in elderberries on my property and I have replanted with uh, things that are not susceptible to verticillium wilt because I wasn't going to leave bare ground sitting there for five years and I've not had a problem with that coming back. This is such a good question. You used to have large ferns along your driveway that you planted there, but they disappeared when you put in the newish garden two years ago on your way from the driveway to the veggie garden. I want to know what your secret is to getting rid of ferns. Excellent question. So we have this huge patch of ostrich ferns um, over in our woodsy area and they're beautiful there and I let them do their thing there and they are an amazing ground cover even though they get like six to seven feet tall. And before I planted the new garden out by the driveway, I was desperate for to put something there. And I didn't want to deal with the disaster that was there. So I transplanted ostrich ferns over there. If we could add up the mistakes I've made in my garden, that would be sort of at the top of the list because ostrich ferns are beautiful, but they can be a little thuggish and they're a little thuggish over there. So how did I get rid of them? Well, first of all, I dug up as many as I could find when I put that garden in. It was well over a hundred and I certainly didn't transplant a hundred over there. So I dug up as many as I could. I actually gave those away. Somebody was happy to come get those. So I gave those away, um, but they still pop up all the time. So every year I just dig them up as they come. And if I can't get around to digging them up, I just lop them off and I never let them get any foliage on them because at least then they're not gaining any energy as they grow. But it's a persistent problem. I'll probably be digging them up from that area for the rest of my life. What's your favorite tomato seedling? Uh, I just did a post on Instagram this past week about uh, tomatoes. And maybe we should do a little bit of a video on this, but long story short, I am a big convert to dwarf tomatoes. If you don't know what they are, dwarf tomatoes are something created by the Dwarf Tomato Project where they take heirlooms and they cross them with dwarf varieties to create heirloom type tomatoes on plants that are like three feet tall, maybe a little taller. Same size tomatoes, small plant. I love it. I'm totally into it. Very hard to find as seedlings in like purchased in a garden center, which is why I start mine from seed. I find tomatoes to be easy to start from seed, but it is extra work and tending and all those things. So, you know, hopefully dwarf tomatoes will make it to garden center soon, but that for now I grow my own and that's basically almost all I'm growing except for when I want to try some new varieties. How do you feel about cutter bees? I know they are beneficial, but they ate major areas on my red bud. I think cutter bees are great. And I think that this is one of those times that a little bit of Zen is required. And we realize that our garden, our garden is not just for us. Our garden is bigger than us. And even though cutter bees, you know, do sort of damage your plants, Look at it as a wonderful thing that you have invited that amazing species into your garden and that they are there and enjoy them for what they are. And I think you're, it's never going to hurt your red bud. It might make it a little bit unsightly, but if you have so many cutter bees that they're, you can see from a distance that they've been busy at your red bud, consider yourself lucky. I have a flower bed that I love, but the soil is so, we're so poor. Um, when I started it like 10 years ago, I was excited and I didn't invest the money or effort into adding soil and compost. Do you think I should dig up the perennials in spring, set them aside, enrich the soil and put them back? I would have to sacrifice bulbs and other things in there, but maybe it's worth it. Have you ever had to start over like this? Uh, I will tell you, um, yeah, I have actually. Um, but also this happens all the time. I think we get so excited to go and like, Spending the money to fix this, it's the most boring thing in the world. Like we don't want to worry about that stuff. We want to get to the good part. And so 
we I think a lot of people deal with this. So first of all, I would say there is a lot of amending that you can do to an existing bed without digging things up. And where I would start with that is by getting, depending on how big this is, getting either bagged or bulk compost, organic compost, and putting on like a two inch layer, like a mulch on there. Do that every year for like three years. And I think you will see a huge difference. If you're sick of dealing with this, you don't want to wait anymore. You absolutely could dig out your garden, fix the soil and replant. And I have done that, although not so much to fix the soil, but to deal with a persistent weed problem. You could do it, you heal them in somewhere else, or you just, if you can do it quickly, if you can get it done in say a weekend, you just wrap them up in a big tarp and keep those root balls moist and keep them in the shade and then plop them back in again. And sometimes to be honest, clearing out a bed and starting over a lot of times, not just for the benefit of the soil, a lot of times the garden ends up better for that, but two methods to deal with that problem. Hi Erin, I've noticed that when I plant flower seeds in my garden, the plants are big and beefy, but they don't flower. What could be the problem? Almost all the time, that means you have too much nitrogen in your soil. So nitrogen creates big, strong, leafy growth, huge growth, great green growth, but you need the other nutrients for flowering and fruiting. So that would be the thing. Now, her next question is, can I recommend a soil test? And she's totally on the right track here. Get a soil test, it'll tell you where you're at. Um, I highly recommend doing a soil test through, a lo through your local public university because A, they're relatively inexpensive. Mine is 15 bucks to do it. It's very easy to send in soil and they know your area. So they will be offer, able to offer you better advice because they know where you're gardening. There are some soil tests available from private companies. I um, tested one a couple of years ago. I'll put a link to that um, uh, in the notes below so that you can uh, check that one out as well. It was fine. I still prefer the public university route just because I feel like I'm getting knowledge that is more geared towards my area. Thank you everyone for those amazing questions. Leave your questions uh, in the comments here and I'll grab some, hopefully, we'll do this hopefully weekly until, I mean, I would like to do it weekly all year, but let's be honest, we know when summer comes, I'm hopeless. So in the meantime, uh, the good news is I have postcards. So I have three postcards. You and people are amazing. So if uh, you saw last week, what I'm doing is asking people to send postcards where they share um, their favorite little thing about a garden they visited. And that's it. So I thought we could all share on these little tips. Here are the first three. Hi Erin, this is not so much a garden pick as it is a dispatch of eternal hope for spring. I love that. The scene is New England coast near Gansett, Rhode Island on a rare day in June. Then if ever come perfect uh, days. Wish you were here. Me too. And I think that's from, it might be from Patty. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the post office is typed over the top of it. Thank you. This is beautiful. This is from, the postcard is from the Spring Bulb Show at Lyman Conservatory at the Botanic Garden of Smith College in Northampton. Erin, my younger sister and I visited Smith College in November for the chrysanthemum show. It was so beautiful there on a sunny day in the greenhouse. We enjoyed lunch and a trip to the Attenborough, Massachusetts, small flower something. I can't read it. Lo local gardener supply. Oh, local gardener supply store here in Haley, I think it's Massachusetts. Anyways, I think that's from Carrie. Love it, beautiful. This is giving me all the vibes here. This beauty right here. Um, we visited Claude Monet's gardens at Giverny. It was heaven, a riot of color in mid-September a few years ago. Tended by an army of horticulturists, it has to be seen and let it wash over you. Some of the plants were labeled, but they just want you to feel the gardens, the ponds, the vistas. The house is a palette of saturated yellows, blues, and corals. You truly expect the big bearded Claude to saunter down the garden paths. This is from Mary. Actually, Mary is local to me, and I just saw Mary the other night, and I'm so happy she shared that memory with me. These are beautiful. I love these. We're going to keep doing fun things with these cards. If you go somewhere this year, 
um, or want to share a memory from something else, send me a postcard information below. I did more than 10 minutes, I think. I haven't been keeping track, but I'm, I'm just guessing it was more than 10 minutes. Thank you for watching. See you next week.